Okay? Then we continue with the environmental transmission part of antibiotic resistance. And we talked about soils as a potential way of spreading resistance also. Now, if you go out basically anywhere and take a sample from a forest or whatever, you're quite likely to find resistant bacteria. Probably also actually resistant bacteria of human origin. Why is that? One reason is because birds poo. Birds get contaminated by our bacteria. For example, if they live near where we release our sewage. So they get infected. This is shown for several species of birds that they carry our pathogens and our resistant bacteria. And they fly basically all over the planet and poo. So you can find their poo everywhere. It's really good. It destroys the possibility to find a clean environment, but it's quite interesting. Uh, just a similar story, actually. There was a paper in, I think it was in Science or Nature some years ago, uh, where uh, a researcher from Denmark showed that uh, the mammoths, they didn't become extinct when we thought they were extinct. Not because he, he was looking for bones or anything like that, but he realized that mammoths probably pooed everywhere. So if you just look at the poo and in the, in the permafrost, you can probably find traces of mammoth much easier, and he did. Wherever you take a sample, you'll find some mammoth DNA from the poo. So, same thing here. They poo everywhere, and we find our bacteria basically everywhere, in very low numbers, of course. Uh, we recently published a paper where we investigated how common different antibiotic resistance genes, ARGs, <clears throat> are in different types of environments. Uh, we looked at different human environments, different external environments. This graph here uh, describes the diversity of different types of antibiotic resistance genes. And the type of environment that had the absolutely highest diversity of resistance genes was air. Air samples from Beijing. Now these were, happened to be basically the only air samples that have been DNA sequenced uh, enough. But when we reported this, this created basically panic in, in, in Japan or in China because of, uh, they were afraid of, of, of these bacteria. Now I should stress that we didn't know whether these were live bacteria or dead bacteria, whether the genes were carried by pathogens or harmless bacteria or how many they were. So, but, but what we stress is that air could actually be a way how resistance genes spread among our environments. And bacteria spread <clears throat> not only between environmental compartments, but also between countries. They spread as fast as a jumbo jet fly because they travel with us. If you go to a country with a high problem of uh, antibiotic resistance in enteric bacteria, such as India, it's shown in several studies that in most cases, more than 50% of the cases, you're likely to carry back multi-resistant bacteria in your intestine when you fly back. So we exchange bacteria between continents all the time with our increased travel. And this means that in order to combat the problem, we cannot just look at our own little area, but also need to look on a more global basis on transmissions and development of resistance. So I've talked about animals, I've talked about the environment, and for the environment we talked about how we can see a, may see a reflection of human activities there. We talked about transmission. And now I'll talk about the environment as an arena for the evolution of resistance in pathogens. So the, uh, so the actual emergence of resistance in, in pathogens. But if we go back in time, when penicillin was invented, 
most pathogens used to be sensitive to antibiotics. We could treat these diseases with antibiotics. The Surgeon General in the US he actually said that now we can basically close the book of infectious disease. We've got antibiotics. Unfortunately, we all know that he was severely wrong. Even Fleming, in his talk when he received the Nobel Prize, warned about the development of antibiotic resistance. But the resistance situation have changed in these bacteria, partly because mutations in their own DNA, but also through the process of horizontal gene transfer, as I know Anne has talked to you about. Uptake of resistance genes and resistance factors from other bacteria. But if we look at the phenomenon of antibiotic resistance, it's actually ancient. These researchers, they digged out 30,000 year old permafrost and analyzed the DNA within that permafrost. There, they find DNA from guys like this, mammoths, side by side with genes that provides resistance to vancomycin, beta-lactams, tetracycline. Why is that? We didn't use very much vancomycin in intensive care 30,000 years ago. Natural variation. It's natural, but why is it natural? Well, one hypothesis, which seems pretty plausible, is that well, these antibiotics that we use today, most of them are derived from natural compounds that microorganisms such as fungi or bacteria produce. And they may use these as competitive agents to fight for resources, for example, in their micro niches. And if they have these, well, we know that they have these antibiotic molecules, the bacteria have accordingly developed defenses against that. And these defense systems are probably as old as are the antibiotics molecules themselves. Because the producer itself needs to protect itself, sometimes, from that agent. Also, right? So there's theories that these protection genes moved from the producer to other bacteria, etc. Or they might have been evolved in the other bacteria that live around the producers. So in the environment, we have this natural ongoing competition of resources where naturally made antibiotics is an important component. So that's probably why we find them there. But as long as they stay in harmless environmental bacteria, that's not a big issue because we don't treat those bacteria with antibody. It doesn't really matter if they are resistant or not. The big challenge, the scary scenario comes when they make to move to pathogens. That's when we face a real threat. Now, think about it. It's quite scary that this transfer event, in principle, only needs to take place once. One side of our planet. Then we have opened Pandora's box, we have a resistant pathogen, and we can't reverse that process. We can't close the lid. It's there. We may reduce the number of resistant bacteria, but we can never eliminate a form of resistant bacteria that has once developed. This makes it particularly important to try to prevent or delay, I would say, as long as possible, uh, the emergence of new forms of resistance in pathogens. Most of our interventions efforts are aimed about uh, controlling or reducing transmission or reducing use of antibiotics. But I think there could be more done to, to preventing the actual emergence of antibiotics as well, of antibiotic resistance as well. But we know that the emergence of resistance is also promoted by selection pressure from antibiotics, which I'll come back to. Now, 
we go out in the environment and find different resistance genes, uh, that might be reflecting some kind of risk for us. Uh, but I would argue that uh, the risks related to the environment and the genes there, they're of course, if they are present in pathogens, that's of course a risk because then we can get these resistant pathogens back to us. But if their genes are just present in other bacteria and they are these known genes that we uh, are struggling with every day in healthcare, I'm not so sure what risk it actually means if they're out there because we have them already in our intestines and in, on our body, these genes and these bacteria. So I'm actually more worried in one way about those genes that we have not yet found in pathogens. So these genes that will come next year and enter a pathogen and, uh, and maybe infect uh, enter a pathogen and then infect us. So much of the research that we're doing in, in my group uh, is about trying to explore what different kinds of resistance factors are out there and what are the risks that these different resistance genes will make it to, uh, uh, to pathogens also. And we have a paper coming out in a few days that will show that for one of these classes of antibiotic resistance genes, one of the very scariest ones, where you find NDM, for example, if you've heard about that kind of resistance genes, it gives resistance to carbapenems, our most powerful class of antibiotics. So we have now a paper showing that we have expanded the known universe of, of those kinds of resistance genes, more than double the known genes to that, by exploring environmental reservoirs. Also. And some of these might end up in pathogens also. Tricky thing is to figure out which ones. So, uh, resistance genes can transfer from harmless bacteria to pathogens. But an important question is, where does this happen? Where do these critical transfer events take place? Well, obvious places where this happens are in the intestines of humans and animals that are given antibiotics. Because here we have a strong antibiotic selection pressure that favors those bacteria that can take up a resistance factor. We also have pathogens often present and we have lots of other bacteria that maybe serve as donors of new forms of resistance. But we may think about the human intestine as a very complex ecosystem with lots of different bacterial species, and that is true, but the diversity in our, in our intestines actually fades into very little if we compare it with the diversity outside of our bodies. The amount of bacteria, the diversity of bacteria and the almost immense diversity of genes that are out there is basically an endless resource of potential resistance mechanisms. I think that for every new antibiotic that we will ever discover, if we continue on the same path we have done before by working with single mole small molecules that we develop as antibiotics, there is already resistance genes out there that are waiting to be recruited into pathogens when we add a huge man-made selection pressure on them. That's my guess. And that is, I think, a major reason why to be interested in the external environment in antibiotic resistance also. Yes, we have a question. to the really long-term plan to manage antibiotic resistance? Gosh, I wish I had the answer to that question. <laughs> I'd argue that there is so far no long-term plan. Well, the long-term plan is to change our way of thinking and not just, try, just trying to find another antibiotic. Of course, we need to do that. We need to find new antibiotics 
and we need to slow down uh, transmission and emergence of resistance. We, may, we basically need to do the latter two things to buy time to develop new antibiotics. But for sort of a final solution, we need to do something else. Like, if we could come up with vaccines against all our pathogens, yep, that would be a solution. Or we have to figure out some kind of antibiotic-like way of treatment that doesn't drive resistance, but that hasn't been developed so far. So, I wish I knew. So, the external environment hosts a wide diversity of genes, some of which are likely to be transferred into pathogens also in the future, under the selection pressure of antibiotics. So, an important question then if we look at the environment is what concentrations of antibiotics drives resistance? Because inside our bodies or in animals, we, we of course we dose ourselves with that, so we have high concentrations of antibiotics. But in the external environments, the concentrations will usually be very much smaller, right? We pee out and that's diluted and it's degraded, etc. So it's small amounts of antibiotics there. Antibiotics? They act by natural selection, and I do think that Anne has explained this, so I won't explain it. But through that selection pressure, we could favor the resistant ones. But a critical question, how much does it take? What concentrations does it, does it take to, to do this? Because it is a matter of concentrations. Sometimes, particularly in media, you hear alarms about, oh, this chemical is found here, or this chemical is found there, and this chemical is toxic, etc., etc. Yeah, but what's the dose? What is the concentration you find? Because the dose makes the poison. This was known in the 1500s that the dose makes the poison. It's the same thing with antibiotics. If you go really, really, really low, it probably doesn't matter and then you go up in concentration and then it starts matter. So we need, to we need to know how much is out there and what are the concentrations that start to select for resistance. So if we look at how antibiotics can select for resistance, this is a graph by, uh, uh, in a paper by Don Anderson's group from Uppsala. And it shows a little bit of the principles of, of selected concentrations. I'll try to explain it to you. So here on the x-axis you have increases antibiotic concentration and on the y-axis you have the growth rate of bacteria. And the two lines here, the blue and the red line, illustrate the growth of two different bacteria. One that is sensitive to antibiotics, which is the blue line here, and one that is resistant to the antibiotic, which is the red line here. And as you can see, as you increase the antibiotic concentration here, the, sensitive bacteria, the growth of the sensitive bacteria goes down, while still the resistant one grows, right? And then when you get sufficiently high, even that one stops growing, okay? So what traditionally was thought about as the sort of the selective window here was here, when you, you treat the, the, uh, the sensitive ones, but these ones survive. These ones die and this one survives, so here, this area here. But if you look here more closely, what happens if you go down below the concentrations that completely inhibits growth of the sensitive strains? Well, these sensitive ones still grow slower than the resistant ones, all the way down until you get to a concentration where the cost of carrying the resistance factor, the mutation or the gene or whatever it is, is counteracted by the benefit, the relative benefit it gets. And that concentration we refer to as the minimal selective concentration, and that can be sometimes quite much lower than this concentration that inhibits pattern of these uh, growth curves, that will differ for all kinds of resistance. Some kinds of resistance are much more costly than others. Some types of resistances are basically not costly at all. But overall, I'd say that, yes, a selected concentration will be lower than the 
minimal inhibitory concentration, but how much lowers? That depends a lot on which resistance factor we are talking about. So sometimes it can probably be a couple of hundred times lower, sometimes it's considerably less. <laughs> so now we have lots of different antibiotics and also lots of different resistance factors. And in practical terms, it would be valuable to have some kind of sort of values on what, what concentrations are likely to drive resistance and what concentrations are probably okay to discharge. Because zero discharge of all chemicals is sort of utopia. You need to sort of think about what's reasonable and how much you can regulate, for example. So uh, last year, um, Johan Bengtsson Palme, who was a PhD student of mine, myself, we uh, published a paper where we thought that, okay, if we, we, can, we know from clinical data, we know that data on which concentration of antibiotic that can completely inhibit growth of some strains, sensitive bacteria. And then we say that, okay, then the selective concentration needs to be lower than that. We don't know how much lower, but probably a, a bit lower than that. And then we can actually compare different types of antibiotics and say that, okay, some probably requires quite a lot to drive resistance, and some it probably requires very little to drive resistance. We published this proposal on, on, on discharge limits that could be applied in different contexts, because it's not really regulated anywhere, how much antibiotics you can discharge. Uh, and it's now under consideration by different uh, industries for voluntary initiatives and by other um, sort, of, sort of regulatory bodies, etc., that are interested in this. But it, we can also do what we call experimental tests, which drives resistance. And we have done that, for example, for tetracycline. And we figured out that, okay, for tetracycline, we found out that one microgram per liter, which is quite little, uh, can promote different, ty different types of tetracycline resistance genes in complex communities. And this was pretty similar to the theoretical predictions that we did before that. Now, antibiotics can select for resistance, and that, I think, is the most critical role it has, but it can also actually increase the speed by which bacteria transfer resistance between species. I know that this is something that Anne is quite interested in. And last year, we published a paper showing that quite low concentrations of teclacycline, much lower than those that kill the bacteria, increase the transfer events between bacteria of resistance. So it might actually contribute a bit also to the process by accelerating the exchange of genes. Now we talked about antibiotics, but I should also introduce to you other kinds of chemicals that can be of importance for antibiotic resistance. And those are antibacterial biocides and metals. Bio antibacterial biocides, these are chemicals that are used to kill bacteria but are not used as medicines inside our bodies. But for example, um, things that we put uh, on soap so that we don't get any bugs from our hands. If you go to the US, there's triclosan in all these soaps, for example, or in your toothbrush, uh, uh, toothpaste, or you add it uh, in um, different even your surfaces in your uh, refrigerator. You have uh, metallic uh, uh, silver, for example, and things like this. These are biocides that are used for preventing bacterial growth. Or chlorhexidine, as you use in your mouthwash, for example. Kill bacteria too. So these may actually promote resistance by something called co-selection, and I'll explain what, what that is. So we talk about two mechanisms, two main mechanisms for co-selection. Either we talk about something called cross-resistance. And this is when a resistance gene, resistant factor, you know, a protein that the, that the bacteria produces, provides resistance not only to the antibiotic 
but also to something else, like a biocide or a metal. It could be, for example, a membrane pump that pumps out antibiotics, but it's also good at pumping out some biocides. So bacteria that carry this kind of pump will be favored by a selection pressure from that biocide, right? Because it will kill the others, but not this one. So it will actually favor the antibiotic-resistant bacteria, because these are the same, right? Now, there's another uh, little bit more complex thing that's called co-resistance. And this is when there is one gene here that provides resistance to the antibiotic, and then there's another gene on the same DNA element, same plasmid, for example, here, that provides resistance to, for say, a metal. So a bacteria that carries a piece of DNA that looks like this will be favored by a selection pressure from a metal. And that bacteria happens to be antibiotic resistant. And this we call co-selection by co-resistance. Okay? If we look at plasmids, and we look at this, this phenomenon, co-resistance, genes that are located together, so we, we collected DNA data from, at the time, all, all fully sequenced plasmids. So there's thousands of, thousands of plasmids from different types of environments. And we looked whether they contained antibiotic resistance genes only, the blue ones, or only biocide and metal resistance genes, orange, or both types of genes here, the blue or, or none of them. You can see the most plasmids, they don't contain any resistance factors. Uh, these biocide and metal resistance genes, they are quite common sort of in different types of environments. It's difficult to see sort of a pattern. But if you look for antibiotic resistance gene plasmids, the blue ones and the green ones, we have them in combination, they are common, really common only in humans and domestic animals. Now, where, which two compartments are intentionally exposed to antibiotics? human and domestic animals, not wild animals, because they don't get antibiotics. So likely the, 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 the fact that quite a few here, there are many percent here that carries both these, it, we think it's probably driven by our historic use of antibiotics. So we don't think, don't think that it's the metal use that have driven this. But now, when we have these elements together, now it's a different story. Now metals can drive resistance through these plasmids. And you should recall that, you can come back to the pig situation in China, for example. You don't have to go as far as that, you can go just to, 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 to Europe also. We use zinc, and in other countries also copper, as growth promoters for pigs, which then is likely to also promote resistance. And actually, just very recently, zinc was banned uh, for use in weaning piglets, partly because of the reason that it, the risk was that it could actually drive resistance. So there is concern about these kinds of co-selection also. Just to provide you some examples of what could happen also, this is another environment where we use lots of biocides. We don't want growth on the hulls of ships, right? Because if we didn't paint them with toxic paint, it would take a month and it would be full with barnacles and blue mussels and slime and stuff. And you'll drive with four knots across the ocean and use up a lot of fuel. So you need toxic paint in some way, right? So it's something that prevents growth. And this is used, what's widely used is copper and zinc paint used on our boats. So we made, we, we wanted to sample these kinds of boats, but it was a little bit difficult, so we did a small experiment, control experiment instead, in the harbor of Gothenburg, where we painted small plates with commercial boat plates, and then we have unpainted panels as well. And then we could see that, and then we scraped off bacteria of these some time, and we grow them, cultured the bacteria there. And we could see that the bacteria that were cultured on the painted panels they were more resistant to copper and they were more resistant to zinc. That makes sense, right? Because they were growing on copper and zinc surfaces. What's more interesting, though, is that... Did I miss out that part? 
Huh, I didn't get it there. The most interesting part I actually took away. So I'll draw what I saw here. They were actually also more resistant to, to antibiotics. Very clearly so. And I think if I remember right, we tested tetracycline, could have been something more also. We have to add this and to the online presentation. We'll do that. Now, here you see the online viewers, the new data as well. Yep. Uh, and we actually looked at the mechanisms there. And what we found was that bacteria that carries efflux genes, they were considerably more common there. So we think that we basically, by this paint, we, we favored bacteria that have efflux genes that can pump out both antibiotics and the metals. So, now we talked about co-selection and, and antibacterial biocides and metals. Let's go back to the antibiotics role in the environment and the selection and evolution of resistance. So, what environments and where can we actually expect selection of resistance by antibiotics in the external environment? Well, here I'm trying to summarize many, many hundreds of studies in one simplified slide on the concentrations of antibiotics in different types of uh, environments. So, at the bottom you'll find surface water here in the EU. You usually find antibiotics concentration ranging from non-detectable up to the nanogram per liter range. Nanogram, that's low. Inside sewage treatment plants, STPs, we find a bit higher concentration. That's also expected, of course. And more concent the source is basically us, right? And it's more concentrated. It's less diluted, and some is not degraded yet. Uh, near and in context with animal farming facilities, you can sometimes find a bit higher, such as these aquaculture facilities in, in Asia. But then there is industrial environments, which I'll talk about later, where you can find a lot more antibiotics sometimes, and I'll come back to that. So, question is, do these concentrations do anything? Coming back to this critical question, how is the dose-response relationship here? This m matters. So, we've done some studies on Swedish sewage treatment plants. These are two plants in Stockholm, one in Uppsala, and uh, we have studied the bacteria there, and try to figure out whether there is selection for resistance. And if we look at just the concentrations of antibiotics in both the inlet in dark blue and the treated water, you see the concentrations go down here for all different antibiotics, basically from inlet to outlet. Most of them, not all actually, but most of them it goes down. Uh, and we, if we compare these to these predicted minimal selected concentrations, the study I showed you that Johan and I uh, published last year, we see that for most of these antibiotics we think that even the concentrations in the inlet are not high enough to select for resistance. That's what we think. But for two of them, the concentrations in the inlet was actually a bit higher than this predicted minimal selected concentration. So maybe tetracycline and maybe ciprofloxacin in here could select for resistance based on that reasoning. Then when we analyze these bacterial communities for the resistance genes that they carry, what we see there is actually that in compared to the how common these resistance genes are in the influent, and that is the red line here, almost resistance genes to almost all classes of antibiotics actually go down. They don't go up, they go down. So resistance genes become less common in the effluents than they are in the influence. And this itself would suggest that at least there is not a strong selection there. We cannot really see that signal in the sewage treatment plants. Still think there's considerably more to do about this, but we, we clearly do not have any evidence that there is selection in the sewage treatment plants today. Uh, then there are reports that make a case of that, oh, we find antibiotics here and we find increased uh, levels of, uh, of antibiotic resistance genes or antibiotic resistant bacteria. Uh, but such a correlation between resistance and antibiotics does not mean that there is selection in that type of environment. Because 
there is a common reason why you find antibiotics and antibiotic resistant bacteria. It's because you have poo there, poo and pee. Because poo and pee is the source both for antibiotics and for the resistant bacteria. So it doesn't mean that selection has taken place in the environment. So I'd summarize that clear evidence for selection here at these concentrations is still an open question. We don't know whether that happens. But in these industrial cases, it's a different story. So for almost a decade now, or more than a decade, we have been working uh, in an area in India uh, where much of the global production of drugs takes place. So here's where they produce the active substances in many of our medicines. In this area, we find more than 100 different industries, uh, and many of these send their wastewater to a common effluent treatment plant here. When we analyzed, when we first analyzed the treated water that came out from this treatment plant, we were astonished by the concentrations we found. These were not nanograms per liter levels, they were not even micrograms per liter levels because some, some of them reached up into the milligram per liter concentration. And that is almost a million times higher of what you would find in a typical Swedish sewage treatment plant. Concentrations here of ciprofloxacin in the treated effluent was considerably higher than what you'd find in the blood of a patient taking medication much higher. So it's, it's important that one recognizes the difference between 30 nanograms and which you'll find here in Sweden or 30 milligrams which you'll find in, uh, in this treatment plant in India. So this is basically the difference. With that I don't want to say that we don't need to care at all about this mosquito. What I say is that we do need to care about the camel. Here. I estimated that from this one plant, 44 kilograms of ciprofloxacin was discharged in one day. 44 kilos. Let's put that in a little bit of perspective. At that time point, the total consumption of ciprofloxacin, which is a very common antibiotic, uh, in entire Sweden was nine kilos per day. So this was five times the use of this common antibiotic in our entire country was discharged through one pipe. It was sufficient to treat a city of hundreds of thousands, hundred thousand people with more, with antibiotics every day, every, every person. Uh, and we also looked in the sediments here, and we found that almost one gram per kilogram organic material in there was fluoroquinolone antibiotics. Hadn't it been so inexpensive, one could probably make a business of mining it from the ground here. We also investigated water wells in the surrounding villages, and we found that all the villages around it have highly elevated levels of drugs, including antibiotics, in their drinking water. And these poor people have very few other water source resources to turn to. Now, Nature wrote about this and referred to it as India's drug problem. But is this India's drug problem, one might ask. Well, some of you shake your heads, uh, and I agree, I don't think it's just India's problems. Several reasons. Uh, first of all, these kinds of pollution doesn't only take place in India, it actually happens elsewhere as well. But also, I think it's our problem from a purely moral perspective, because these factories produce the drugs that you and I are using. We rely on the inexpensive drugs produced by these factories, as we could show in a paper. Uh, 
The other reason why I think it's not just India's problem is if these high discharges of antibiotics also drive antibiotic resistance. And if we, when we took samples from inside these treatment plants of bacteria, every bacteria we looked at was multi-resistant. A typical bacterium here was resistant to around 30 of 39 tested antibiotics. That was the typical bacterium. Some were resistant to basically everything. And they also contained, I don't know if you talked about integrons. No, it's a system how bacteria can actually collect multiple resistance genes and stack them to become multi-resistant. And almost all of these bacteria had this kind of collection system for antibiotic resistance genes. That's quite uncommon otherwise, actually, if you just look at environmental bacteria. And if you look at it on a larger basis, I come back to this study we published where we investigated resistance genes in different environments. These environments that are polluted from pharmaceutical manufacturing, they have the most antibiotic resistance genes per per bacterium, basically, than all other investigated environments, including our own gut and the gut flora of animals also. And also, if you look at the machinery, the genetic machinery to exchange and move around genes, I mentioned integrons as one such machinery. There's others called, for example, transposons. When we look for these in different environments, Again, these are the most extreme environments on Earth. And I think another learning lesson from this graph is that here you have the human microbiome, those bacteria that live on and inside us, and here you have the environmental ones. You see there's a big difference here, right? This is a logarithmic scale here. The bacteria that live in us, they are not very good at exchanging genes, it looks like, but these environmental guys, they are much better in shuffling genes and moving around them like this. So the plasticity in the environment seems to be much bigger than for those bacteria that thrive on us. Um, yeah, that's what I did here. So how does it look like in these environments when it comes to resistance? Also, I showed you how it was in this treatment plant, but here, We've also looked at a couple of lakes where we found that industries basically dump their antibiotic contaminated waste. So we have milligram per liter concentrations of antibiotics in the surface water of, of these lakes. And when we look at the resistance pattern, by, to not big surprise, they were considerably more resistant here than they were in other Indian lakes or Swedish lakes. And then we asked ourselves, can, can, these, um, can these environments be basically spawning grounds for resistance? Can, uh, can resistances that develop here be transferred to, to human pathogens? Well, that's really difficult to know, but we did some experiments to try to figure that out. Uh, so we um, basically used E. coli bacteria that were sensitive to antibiotics and they were tagged with GFP, it's a protein that makes them glow, so we can easily fish them out afterwards because they're glowing and the other ones are not. So we let these sensitive E. coli bacteria sit together with bacteria from the slime here at the edge of the, the lakes and uh, let them sit together for a few hours and then we added antibiotics. And the antibiotics would then kill all the green bacteria, right, because they were sensitive to antibiotics, unless they had taken up resistances from these uh, uh, environmental bacteria. And when we, it looks like these on the plates here. So these are the glowing ones and these are the non-glowing ones. And when we do this with bacteria from these polluted lakes and from sort of clean Indian lakes and, and, and clean Swedish lakes, this is the pattern we see. No green bacteria survived in the Swedish lake or here, but here they acquire resistance to different types of antibiotics within a few hours if they sit together. And we followed up by sequencing what kinds of plasmids they got and we found that 
Yes, indeed, there are new variants of plasmids, and we actually found a gene that was previously known to be sitting on a chromosome, and now we found it on a plasmid that can move around easily. So, the conclusions here about antibiotics emission is that usage of antibiotics leads to emissions of low concentrations of antibiotics, but it's still, we still lack clear evidence if these concentrations select for antibiotic resistance. They might do, or maybe not. Whereas manufacturing discharges of antibiotics, they can be much, much higher, and there's evidence for selection of multi-resistant bacteria here. Uh, we know that a wide variety of resistance genes are enriched, and we know that resistance can easily transfer here to pathogens. And I'll then just end by mentioning a few ways on how could we deal about managing these kinds of industrial emissions that I just talked about. What can we do about that? Well, I think the first critical thing to do is to create awareness, like we're doing here today, about the issue. If people don't know that this might be a problem, nothing will be done about it. That's the starting point. So awareness is important, and here media also has a, an important role to play. One way I think that could incentivize change is to increase transparency in the production chain, meaning that you'd require that the companies had to tell you about where they produce their drugs and under what environmental conditions they do it. Because as it is now, they don't have to tell you. Many journalists have tried and, and asked companies where are your active ingredients produced and what are your emissions? And a very common answer is, this is confidential information. So if we compare that with other products in society, such as food or clothes, it's a different, ball, ball, different, ball, different game, right? Because here we are used to be able to see where are my fish fished? Where are my vegetables produced? You can actually read for most of the contents in your food where it comes from, etc. And also now when you buy a t-shirt, you can figure out on the website of the company which factory in Bangladesh, perhaps, that produced it. And the code of conduct there for social welfare and things that they have here. So, and, and this has been driven by consumer pressure and consumer pressure have made transparency an important part here. But the pharmaceutical market is a regulator, so we don't have that really that, that power so far. I think transparency could be a very cheap way of creating incentives for companies to clean up their act. Another thing to think about is the generic substitution system for drugs. You know that when you go to the pharmacy and you're going to collect your medicines, the person there at the desk may say to you, well, this month you'll actually get this medicine because this is the thing that is subsidized by tax money. If you don't take this one or you, if you want that one that you're asking for, you have to pay everything yourself. You get the same compound, it will work effectively the same, but it's a different name produced by a different company. Now, this puts a lot of pressures on the companies to produce the very cheapest compound because this is the cheapest, cheapest uh, product, because it's the cheapest product that is subsidized by tax money. This is a system we have in Sweden, but in many other countries as well, because it saves money for the state and for the insurance companies if it works like that. We think that it, this creates counter incentives for investing in cleaner production because it doesn't pay off. So there is actually a proposal now on the Swedish parliament level to change this, to actually also take into account pollution control when the state decides which products should get reimbursed by tax money. But nothing is decided about this yet. Second, uh, another point is procurement. Procurement means uphandling in Swedish. 
So basically, most drugs are not procured, but they're bought by uh, pharmacies, but some parts are bought by hospitals, and they are procured. So the hospital can decide, or the county council, uh, Landsting it, they can decide which products they buy. And when they buy, they can put demands also on environmental aspects when they do that. And our county council here is doing that. Most county councils in Sweden are starting to actually ask for environmental control pollution programs when they're buying drugs. Unfortunately, the demands are not so well phrased yet, so that they don't mean that much. The companies doesn't really have to have much of a control program, but it's in the process of being revised. And now the United Nations are, are looking at this and thinking about something like this, and also Norway. Sweden has also suggested on the EU level to change what's called the good manufacturing practice of drugs. This is a framework that regulates quality of drugs, so that ensures that you will get good quality drugs, but they propose that you will include environmental pollution aspects here as well. And the trick about that is that this could be a way to enforce regulations outside of Europe, because everyone that wants to sell drugs in Europe needs to follow the European GMP. And if we include environmental aspects here, we could sort of put pressure on manufacturers that are also outside of Europe. Of course, national pollution standards are needed, and I haven't seen any such pollution standards yet, but on the 17th of April, India's government came out with a plan and say, we will, in within three years, develop and implement pollution standards for antibiotic discharges at our, at our manufacturing sites. So they're aware of the problem, they recognize it, they have a good intention. Let's hope that it happens also. And what happened just recently also, just a few weeks ago, there's a, comp there's a foundation called Access to Medicines. It's a foundation that rank pharmaceutical companies based on their ability to provide medicine to poor people in developing countries. And companies that care about their brand name, at least those, they care about this ranking also. They want to get a high rank here. Now they're going to rank the antibiotic producers. And this time they have expanded the ranking, not only to include access to medicines to poor, but also on the company's control over their pollution situation as well. So it's very clear and, 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 and specific demands here. So of all, I think there is some movement now lately in the right directions. So it takes some time, but I think we will see a change soon. <laughs>